Welcome to News Mongolia, where we bring you the late stories and updates from across the nation and beyond. I'm Batsir Namshar. For our top stories, Prime Minister Oyung Irdung explored leading international practices in combating desertification. People with disabilities face limited employment opportunities. The Movable Dinosaur Museum brings ancient fossils to life across Mongolia. For the news, stay tuned. During the 16th Conference of the Parties to United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, countries and international organizations showcased their initiatives and special pavilions in COP16's blue and green zones. The Prime Minister of Mongolia, Oyung Irtin Lobsen Namstray, visited several pavilions to learn about leading practices in combat and desertification. In the Blue Zone pavilions, Conferences and events are held to promote the activities of governments and international organizations. The Green Zone pavilions, which are open to the public, are predominantly organized by the private sector and non-governmental organizations. Prime Minister Oyung Irtung explored the best practices that align with the Mongolian government's key priorities, including combating desertification, reducing air and environmental pollution, improving water supply and adapting to climate change. He emphasized that this year's conference, with high-level participation from governments and the private sector, marks a significant step toward effectively implementing measures to combat desertification. During this important visit, meetings are being held with countries to collaborate on the upcoming COP17, which will take place in Mongolia. These meetings aim to secure support, foster partnerships and enhance the benefits of multilateral cooperation. Today's conference will address key issues such as combating drought, desertification and land degradation, as well as restoring soil and land by 2030, enhancing drought preparedness and resilience, promoting sustainable and environmentally friendly food production, improving governance, ensuring women's land ownership rights, increasing youth engagement and creating more land-related job opportunities for young people. Mongolia has set up blue and green zone pavilions at COP for the first time. Mongolia's governmental and non-governmental organizations, the private sector and specialized UN agencies collaborated on creating the pavilions. People with disabilities face barriers to stable employment with only 10% employed in government or non-governmental organizations. Inaccessible environments, negative attitudes and inadequate infrastructure limit their job opportunities despite legal requirements for hiring. Efforts are underway to improve job placements and training programs. Only about 10% of working-age people with disabilities are employed in government or non-governmental organizations. According to statistics, 75% of those employed are between 35 and 64. The rest struggle to find stable employment and cannot earn regular wages, as reported by representatives of families with people with disabilities. People with disabilities also have the responsibility to support themselves financially. However, job opportunities are limited and wages are often not paid on time in private companies. When working at a single place, even in construction, workers with disabilities sometimes don't receive their wages. Some employers only hire people with disabilities without paying attention to their needs. My brother has a disability in his lower limbs and it is difficult for him to go up fourth floors because there are no ramps or elevators for access. One of the reasons people with disabilities cannot secure employment is the lack of accessible environments in organizations and negative attitudes toward them. Even if they manage to get a job, problems arise due to the lack of accessible public transportation, facilities in the workplace, ramps, and other necessary infrastructures. These issues discourage organizations from hiring people with disabilities. 
Many organizations approach the employment of people with disabilities with the mindset that it's easier to just pay fines or taxes rather than make the necessary accommodations for them. People with disabilities are eager to work, but due to inaccessible environments, such as ramps and facilities, they often become discouraged and give up on looking for jobs. According to the labor law, organizations with 25 employees or more are required to hire at least one person with disability. However, officials note that this regulation is not adequately enforced. To increase the employment rate of people with disabilities, training programs for workplace and structures have been initiated. We are developing a system to identify appropriate jobs for people with disabilities, provide training and help create workplaces where they can earn an honest income. Further, we are planning to organize advanced training sessions to help them advance in their careers. People with disabilities have the right to work and earn a living, just like others, according to their skills. However, due to inaccessible roads, safety issues and inadequate workplaces, they are unable to fully exercise their right to work outside of their homes. For over 10 years, the Movable Dinosaur Museum has traveled across Mongolia, educating the public about the country's rich paleontological heritage. Having already visited 18 provinces, the museum showcases ancient fossils and dinosaur remains, providing a rare opportunity for children and communities in remote areas to learn more about these prehistoric creatures. Despite Mongolia's abundance of fossils, public awareness about paleontology remains limited. Paleontologist Dr. Balertsek, the founder of the Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs, brought this unique mobile museum from the United States over a decade ago. Her vision was to bridge the knowledge gap and make Mongolia's fossil discoveries more accessible to the public, especially children. Um, well, um, our organization is called Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs. So one of our program is Movable Dinosaur Museum. So this is uh, uh, the museum, um, the bus is about 12 meters long. And so this um, movable museum used to be running around New York City. So they used to reach out to schools, you know, uh, different um, parts of New York. Um, so the program closed around 2013. So I, I'm actually associated with American Museum of Natural History. So that's where I do my research as a paleontologist. Um, so when I heard about this program was closing and I knew about this dinosaur uh, bus, because inside has exhibits about Mongolian dinosaurs. So, uh, so for me, it was a good idea to bring it to Mongolia. It was very challenging to shipping out to a long distance to bring it to Mongolia. The museum's success is partly due to Dr. Bollertzek's students and the next generation of young dinosaur enthusiasts who now guide their peers through the exhibits, sharing their passion and expanding the reach of paleontological knowledge. We spoke to one of these young museum guides. Of course, it was a very experiencing a journey and uh, we went for eight days straight. I visited a Flaming Cliffs and there was a fossil with 15, 15 protocer, uh, baby protoceratops. Mm -hmm. And I really love that fossil. And mm -hmm. of course, I love protoceratops. I'm just happy that uh, other kids my age learn something new uh, that day. And when they visit our museum, I'm just happy they learn something new. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, I uh, did a presentation and uh, it was about the Tarbazar's Batar. In the coming year of 2025, the museum plans to travel to three more provinces, continuing its mission to inspire future generations of paleontologists and educate rural communities about Mongolia's ancient treasures. Dr. Balertzerk plans to build a community-based dinosaur museum in the Gobi region. 
We wish her success in her future endeavors. Now let's take a look at the currency exchange rates provided by Mongol Bank. Now let's take a look at international news from our partner agencies. Thousands of Georgians gathered outside the parliament in Tbilisi on Wednesday night in protest against the governing party's decision to suspend negotiations on joining the European Union. Protesters wrapped with Georgian and European flags whistled at riot police guarding the entrance to the parliament. The police did not disperse the crowds. During the past six nights, riot police used water cannons and tear gas to disperse the demonstrators who threw fireworks at police officers and built barricades on the Georgian capital central boulevard. More than 300 protesters have been detained since Thursday and over 100 people have been treated for injuries. On Wednesday, the Coalition for Change opposition party said that police raided its offices and detained its leader, Nika Gavaramia. It shared a with Video showing several officers dragging Gavaramia into a car. Georgian media reported that police also raided the offices of several other opposition groups and non government organizations. Prime Minister Irakli Kabahize of the Georgian Dream Party said the raids targeted those who encourage violence during protests in an attempt to topple his government. The ruling Georgian Dream retained control of parliament in the disputed October 26th election, which was widely seen as a referendum on Georgia's EU aspirations. The opposition and the pro-Western president have accused the governing party of rigging the vote with neighboring Russia's help and boycotted parliament sessions. Mass opposition protests sparked by the vote gained new momentum after the governing party's decision on Thursday to put the EU accession talks on hold. Intensified fighting in northwest Syria has displaced more than 100,000 people in just a week, according to David Carden, the UN's deputy regional humanitarian coordinator for the Syria crisis. Speaking on Wednesday, Carden highlighted the devastating toll of the renewed violence which has struck schools, hospitals and civilian areas. The latest flare-up in Syria's long civil war comes after forces opposed to President Bashar Assad ousted his troops from Aleppo and seizing towns and villages in southern parts of the northwestern Idlib province, likely exploiting the fact that Assad's main regional and international backers were preoccupied with their own wars. The immediate impact of this escalation uh, is on the people of northwest Syria. We've heard that 115,000 people have been displaced during the last week. And the reason why they've been displaced during the last week is that hospitals have been hit uh, and schools have been hit. I mean, in Idlib city alone, there was a significant uh, escalation uh, in airstrikes uh, and in shelling uh, on the first two days of December. The conflict, now in its 13th year, has seen cycles of violence that continue to devastate communities and displace families. The UN and humanitarian organizations are calling for greater efforts to address the escalating crisis and protect vulnerable populations in the region. Well, that's all for today. Thank you for staying with us. We'll see you on Friday with more news and updates. Have a nice evening. Goodbye.